My parents had uh, pretty strong faith, but it wasn't out there in your face. They went to Mass every Sunday. We didn't do prayers at home. We didn't do any of the common things that Catholic families may have done, like a rosary and everything, but Sunday Mass was pivotal in our whole life, but it was the way my parents acted and would talk about God, but we'd never pray as a family, which was always, you know, amazed me in a way. My mum was very compassionate. If she saw someone else in need, she would have to help them. And saw someone else getting picked on, or then she would defend them. Mum was very compassionate to other people. Um, I'd say steadfastness. Dad was just solid. Farming stock, but absolute solid. You could rely on Dad. If he said he was going to do something, he would do it. He wasn't devious and he was just straight down the line, solid. My parents did an unusual thing. As a little child, they wouldn't let me go to Mass. And my parents did countercultural things like that. So they'd come into Mass and they'd drop me off at my grandmother's house. And I had to wait. Because they said I was too young and I'd be mucking around, be naughty like all the other kids. We didn't want that at Mass. Mass is too important. When you're responsible enough, you can do it. So all I ever wanted to do as a little child was go to Mass. Can I go to Mass this and that? Nope. Just see how you behave. So when I got the opportunity to actually go with my parents to Mass, I was just the perfect uh, child. I mean, it was a privilege from the, I was never forced to go. It was always, I always saw it as a privilege. So I think that helped a lot. So I really had the thirst for that. And just through school, through my favourite teacher, Mrs Purcell, who was um, very, very ill at one stage. I remember coming into this church and the school was praying for her. And I never prayed in my whole life like that. And she got better, but in the midst of that time of praying for my teacher, my favorite teacher, that got really, I know this, this God thing, fair dinkum, this is, this is good. And that would have been in about year five or something, primary school. And then throughout school, you know, I went to, school masses, I, I learnt myself. So I got books and I read them. I remember when I was in sixth class, I got the documents of the Second Vatican Council, the bookshop in Bathurst. I started to read them and in year seven, and I went through the documents of the Second Vatican Council. So not bad for a primary school kid, I thought, just to start that off. So I always had that real interest and that just developed being bullied a bit and, and suffering a bit out there took me closer to the Lord for consolation so I, got my, I think that helped my relationship with God. It was um, yeah and I, I didn't have a whole group of friends and and all that so I think that helped me grow the, over the time at secondary school. For me first hint of a vocation would have been when I was daydreaming usually mathematics, because I was no good at maths at all, still no good at maths. Um, and I'd daydream a lot about my future and what I wanted to do. And I'd always daydream about being a radiographer or being a farmer or being a, yeah, being a, a job. And I'd have a picture of my house and I'd have it all planned in my daydreams. And then suddenly I, I had this, this dream would just come in of a priest, me as a priest. That was ridiculous. I almost thought that was a, a, an intrusion. So I got rid of that in my mind, got back to the other daydreams. And this kept on coming occasionally. I'd see myself as a priest. And it occurred to me one day that when I pictured and daydreamed about doing everything else in my future life, I was always the same age. I was a young bloke, maybe 35. I had a family and I had the little house and that was the same age. But when, I, when this, uh, this picture of a priest would come in, my daydream, all different ages. Sometimes I could see myself as an old priest or, or a young priest at different ages. And I thought, isn't that interesting? I couldn't picture myself being an old retired radiographer. That didn't enter my daydream. I couldn't actually say, but I could always picture myself being an old retired priest or an elderly priest, young priest. So I said, maybe this is something I should look into because I thought that was quite strange. So that's probably how I started to actually consider being a priest and then asked about, you know, what do you do to, after school? Got some um, priestly advice. I was told you don't pursue it straight after school. Go and get a taste of the world first. Test your vocation. Do something to test it. So that's when I joined the army. 
I thought that's going to test it because total different personality, just that's the opposite to that, just rock my world, sort of antisocial sort of nerd type person that I was. That was just something out there. So the first day I went into the army, or the first time I just told every, all our soldiers I'm going to be a priest. I mean, it's just to test me if this is right for me. So they would all test me and try and get me not to think about that for the whole thing. So I did that, that just solidified what I was going to do. So it just sort of went on from there. So it was a gradual development, I suppose, of a vocation. I joined um, the Franciscans straight away from the army and they promised the soldiers prom promised to come. They ring me every, every week and if I wasn't happy, they'd come and spring me from the joint and rescue me. So uh, I joined them. I was with the Conventional Franciscans for a couple of years. Then I left them and joined the Order of St Paul the First Hermit, which I'm still a, a member. It's a very Marian order, so Our Lady is really important and probably central. The charism of the order is it's our semi-contemplative order. So one of our big apostolates is to run shrines, in particular Marian shrines. So places that we conduct where people come to on a pilgrimage and you serve the people and then they go away. So you can have all like, hundreds of people, thousands of people, but then you can have quiet for the rest of the week till the next it came. So it's sort of on and off that both types of life. And I thought that really appealed, appealed to me. The, but the, only, the only apprehension and fear I had was maybe joining the wrong order or, or taking the wrong path. I knew pretty well my vocation I had to do that was whether it's a Franciscan or a Salesian or whatever type of whatever order I was called to, I knew that I had my vocation. Um, the apprehension would probably have been whether I could have done the studies. So that was a probably a little bit of apprehension there, but didn't need to worry about that but that was an apprehension whether I'd be good enough and I suppose the old thing of really because you're not worthy of it so I used to you know I had that big thing I said who do you think you are putting yourself out to do this you're, you're not good enough you know, we know what you what you do you know there's a lot of things I'm not very proud of in my life and you sort of know that so I think the big apprehension was am I just deluding myself because I'm just not good enough but I used to actually think as a, as a young person, just at school, I said, well, and this helped me, I said, well, even if I'm not good enough to be a priest myself, but if I can bring someone else to God, that might get me there. Yeah, I might be a saint myself, but if I can facilitate someone else becoming a saint, how good is that? They might get me in. So that's how I got through those apprehensions in the early days of my vocation. Greatest joy Seeing the faces of people that have got an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and their lives are changed by something that you or manage were privileged enough to facilitate as a priest or a bishop. It could be at a wedding, could be an anointing of the sick, which is amazing. Sometimes you just see the physical manifestation of the spiritual grace. And I just said, wow, what a privilege. And that helps you get through the difficult times, your vocation. I found that sort of helped me. I can stop and think about it. Well, what are we doing? Remember that, remember that, remember that. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right, thank you. They, they helped me a lot. The apathy of people even in the church to what's going on, to the, real, the supernatural reality. I suppose that's the biggest thing. I just thought, well, this is good, you know. You know, um, would you like a blessing? Oh, okay. If it, if it floats your boat farther. Well, oh, blessing's such an important thing. But the apathy of people and the apathy of other clergy was actually a big shock for me. and still is a surprise to me that people just aren't full of uh, wonder and awe. And, you know, you almost have to push them. So if you're with the flock, you, you, you know, you say, well, go this way, people. And they all were fired up with the Holy Spirit going that way. Uh, it's more like, oh, do we have to go that way? Uh, uh, apathy, I think, is the thing that I find most difficult. 
Um, what do I love about the bishop being the bishop of Kenyaful? It's interesting, that question was the hardest question that someone asked me when I was first made a bishop at Red Bend Catholic College. I think it was year 10. A year 10 person came up and said, what's the best thing about being a bishop? That was the question and I stopped and they stumped me. I couldn't think of anything that was actually good about being a bishop. Because I'm thinking ministering for people, preaching, well I did all that as a priest. But particularly as a bishop, what was the thing that, that, that really was, that I enjoyed? After eight years being a bishop, I can answer the question now. So one of the most brilliant things about being a bishop, that I like of being a bishop, or Kenya Fork, I can change people's lives, make them happy by turning up to an event. I've just got to turn up. I don't have to even say anything. Oh, if the bishop comes, the you know, bishop goes and visits somebody on an isolated station, We've never had a bishop come in. They get so thrilled. You, you, you can actually bring joy to someone by just your presence as a bishop, not personally myself, but because the bishop came. And I thought, well, that's a great privilege and something very easy. To do. I've just got to turn up. I would like to think I'm not that useless. I couldn't have done something else in my life. I, I'm, I'm not one of the occasions that become you join the church because you're too useless to do anything else. I wouldn't think. Um, I think it's that, it's that personal relationship and it's, it's, for me it's, it's you've got to continually work at it. I'm not a natural sit down in the chapel, two hours meditation and praying or something. I have to actually push myself to do things. I don't get joy out of sitting there um, even doing a divine office. It's a duty and I said, well, I'm doing this for you God, that's fine. But you get out and drive out in the bush and then I can just talk to the Lord and just know his presence in different ways. Dealing with my limitations, my human limitations of uh, being able to concentrate, to be able to actually do things which I try to push myself to do. And the Lord says, just, is just, said, just be here you are. I know what you like. I've called you despite that. You've got to have faith that, okay, you might be a rough diamond, but I have called you. That's what I want. I want you not what you think you should be like. And I think that's, that's something I would like to try and you know, let other people know that, that sometimes we, we have our best perception of what we think we should be like in the Lord's service. And sometimes we've got to just trust the Lord. He knows what we're like. He's called us with all our faults and our weaknesses. And that's what grace is. Grace is there to actually transform us images of Christ and that might take a long time and it might be a slow process but it's the journey and that's our journey of life so you know we put it in a very long sort of way that that I suppose is the way I see it anyway that's how it works in my life well I would say explore the vocation you know be open to your vocation be open to um, it being tested that people won't understand your vocation, be prepared for that, but just test it, give it a go. I mean, that's it. If it doesn't work out, don't be afraid of it not working out and you've got to say, well, I tried this and no, it didn't work for me. Don't be afraid of that because that's part of life. You'll never, never know unless you give it a go. So just always be open to, to try something. Sometimes we just put everything in a too hard basket and no one actually takes that little step. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go and visit a religious community on my holidays or something. I'll spend a week with them and see what, what that does. I mean, little things like that. Go and talk to a priest. Go and talk to a sister. Actually start getting some information and find out in yourself whether that fuels the fire or it puts the fire out completely, either way you've got to actually follow through one way or the other to close the door and it's not a real religious vacation, this is not for me. I have tried that, I have explored it. Then you know, otherwise you get so many people that you know have said no and they've gone somewhere else, but they've never explored it. And years down the track, secretly, they wish they, I think they should have went to the convent or they should have been a priest after they've got there their kids and grandkids, they're, they're, they're torn. Close the door or be open to it being open one way or the other. You've got to, you've got to resolve 
the issue of whether you've got a calling or not. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know that you are so good. You love us so much. You showed us your love by sending your Son to be born of flesh as we are flesh. You know our weaknesses. You know our anxieties, pains and discomforts. You are there, you always say that you are the rock. We have to build our lives on you, the rock of your word. I'd ask you to give an increase in faith, hope and love to all those who are on their journey of life which really ultimately is that journey to you. For those that are having difficulty um, discerning a vocation, um, exploring the idea of a vocation, or making a final decision to commit their lives to you or to someone else, I'd ask you to bless them, give them courage, give them strength, and give them peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.